I want, uh, first, I want to tell you a little story about why I'm passionate about this. Um, but there's a lot of reasons I'm passionate about it, but this really started early. Back in 1991, I lived in San Francisco. I was the art director for a newspaper called the San Francisco Bay Guardian, and uh, which actually just went under last October, which is uh, horrifying for me because that's basically my graduate school. Um, it wasn't always a great place to work. Uh, the, it was run by a, a, a couple who had run it since 1965, and they, uh, they didn't pay us very well. I had worked there for four years. I was a senior person in the building, and uh, I was making $26,000 a year in San Francisco. Wow. It's hard to live there on, on $100,000 a year, for that matter. Um, I asked for a raise of $2,000 a year. I was turned down flat, and I quit because I was going to raise a family, and I couldn't do that anymore. Um, they figured they could find other people to replace me, and they did. That's the way they operated. Um, but I decided I was going to take my graphic design skills and put them to work for myself. I was going to start my own business. And I went to my bank at the time, which was Wells Fargo, and I said, I'd really like to get an $18,000 loan to buy my top-of-the-line Mac 2 FX with 8 megabytes of RAM. <laughs> that was top-of-the-line back then, and 16 megs of hard drive. It was amazing. Um, $18,000 with that and for that and the software that I needed to do to get going. Um, they turned me down flat. There was no way. I couldn't meet their guidelines. They had to send it back to wherever and, and get the approvals. Um, so there was no hope. But I did my research, and I found a community bank called the University National Bank in Menlo Park, California. And I went in there. It was founded by, uh, by bankers who used to work for the big banks, but were sick and tired of turning down people they knew were going to be good risks because they didn't meet the formulas that the people back at the head office set for them. So I sat down with one of the vice presidents, this young punk kid who was the art director for some alternative hippie weekly. <laughs> and, uh, and I told him what my plan was. I didn't have any clients. I didn't have any, I didn't have any basis to repay that. I didn't have a house. But I had a plan, and I was able to look in his eyes and tell him what I was going to do. And he gave me the loan. No big bank from Wall Street is going to do that. I, I had to pay it back at $500 a month for 36 months. And, uh, and uh, that was tough when I had no clients. I had to I face a $500 payment the next month. I went out there, I beat the bushes, and I paid back the loan 24 months early. Mm -hmm. And uh, I moved to Arizona. I've been continuing to create jobs for the last 24 years. I now am um, basically an export business because I do public art all over the country, and I hire people here to go out and install them and fabricate them and all the rest of them. And all this happened because a bank vice president was willing to meet with this punk kid and give him 18,000 hard-earned bucks to start this all off. That has to happen in this state. It has to happen. And when you see the community banks in the last five years going down from 30 to 12, and I just recently heard from the director of finance for institutions that out of those 12, four to five of them are at risk of going under the next two years. That's a crisis for our state. Um, you mentioned earlier the issue about the uh, produce companies at the border. Uh, we are in a pitch battle with Texas, New Mexico, California to keep produce companies here in Arizona to be able to provide the jobs that they, that they provide. And they are, the, the, uh, these produce companies, I've talked to them, um, they have recently had an issue in the last few months in which the big banks who offer them their lines of credit, and they have really big lines of credits, 50 to $150 million, because they have fields in Mexico that they have to pay for all the expenses of growing the produce, and they don't get paid until they deliver the produce. So they've got a big line of credit that they have to draw, draw in order to make that happen. They were getting calls from Chase, City, Wells Fargo, telling them that they were summarily cutting off their lines of credit and their accounts with less than a week's notice because they had figured that anybody doing business in Mexico was money laundering. These were companies that had 
had been in business for generations, operating out of Rio Rico Nogales, and yet all of a sudden, here they are not being able to do their business because they can't get the access to capital that they have been paying back dependably for decades. So they were trying to figure out what to do. They considered creating their own community bank. The Bank of Yuma was able to lend to them, but they didn't have the capitalization necessary to be able to extend that kind of lines of credit to them. A state bank, as a banker's bank, would be able to lend that money to the, uh, the Bank of Yuma, for example, so that they can then extend it to these businesses. And if we were able to do that on a large scale, the, with the community banks as the face of the public, and the wholesale money coming from the state, of all that money that we we're paying there anyway, then we could, that would be a huge competitive advantage for us against those other border states we're competing with. We'd probably get more companies moving here from Texas just because they'd have better access to capital. And it isn't just produce companies. It's all types of entrepreneurial companies wanting to come here because we're going to invest in people who do business in Arizona. Now that's in stark contrast to part of why we're in the budget deficit now. Over the last uh, five years, we have slashed corporate taxes that primarily went to out-of-state corporations. Those tax giveaways went out of state, and we've gotten nothing in return for them. We were promised we'd see a huge flowering of the economy, we'd get more than those revenues back, there'd be many more jobs all over the place, businesses coming here. We got nothing except for a $500 million deficit this fiscal year ending in June, and another billion next year. And, and and you actually, when you look at that, I just got to figure today, the, the tax cuts that uh, went into place two years ago have been phased in. There's still three more years of phase in for those big corporate tax cuts. By the time they're phased in in fiscal 18, they will represent cuts of 44% of the corporate income tax oh, collections. God. They didn't tell you they were cutting our corporate income tax by 44%. That's what they're doing. Uh, even Governor Brewer on her way out said, hey, time to suspend those things. We don't have the money anymore. And Ducey has not uh, been going along with that. We're hoping that maybe he'll see the light. You just can't do it without shutting down everything we depend on in our state. And I'm getting distracted about this stuff. I want to go back to the optimistic thing. Um, in the legislature, I really enjoy finding things I have in common with people that I disagree with. It's, it, there's a lot of people I disagree with the legislature, you might imagine. But uh, one of those people who is incredibly conservative, a very conservative Mormon from East Mesa, is David Farnsworth. He was appointed uh, a couple of years ago to replace Rich Crandall, who was a, a pretty moderate Republican who I worked with a lot. Um, and when he was appointed, he was seated next to me on the floor. So he and I would talk a lot about stuff on the floor and sort of you know, joke with each other and then figure out what we had in common and what we didn't have in common. And we created a really good relationship where we really understood each other in, in a lot of different ways. So when he was a, given the chairmanship of the Financial Institutions Committee, he came over to my office as soon as he heard about it and said, Steve, you've got the ideas. I've got the passion and the power. Let's work together. I was like, okay, I'll do that. Um, and we've been talking ever since, and he has so much energy to like look in the research and make that happen. Um, it's, it's very powerful. So when I talk to him about the idea of something to strengthen community banks, a, a, a state bank that would enable us to keep our money here instead of ship it off to Wall Street, he's jumped all over it. And from his perspective, it's important to understand how people as conservative as him on, are think, and I've often been trying to do that as well. I went to an Agenda 21 hearing um, that Sylvia Allen was at, who's now our newest senator. Uh, Agenda 21 is that Rio Declaration you may have heard about the far right wing believes as a communist conspiracy by the UN to undermine the American way of life. I went to a hearing they had about this, they had bike paths and community gardens are part of that conspiracy. Um, to try to understand why they were saying this. Sometimes it doesn't make any sense, but what was really there, what I really got, and it seemed to be in common with everyone on the far right, was a basic fear, fear about what was happening to their society. Things have changed at such a dramatic pace and they didn't understand what was going on. 
Sylvia talked about a, 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 a paper mill going under in her part of the country in the, in the White Mountains and how that devastated the community. And she blamed it on the environmentalists. Well, in fact, it was the environmentalists. It was the global economy. You, it doesn't pay to make paper in Arizona anymore. If you're getting it so cheap from the rainforest deforestation in the Amazon or in Southeast Asia. So it's those sorts of things that I think we have common ground with the right. They're concerned with what happens with the global economy and free trade agreements and various other things that end up benefiting the people at the top, but not the people, the 99% of us, who don't have access to that kind of capital or global economy. Um, so Mr. Farnsworth comes from a perspective of he has a basic distrust of large institutions, a basic distrust of Wall Street, a basic distrust of the Fed, and a basic distrust of D.C., those things can really dovetail with what we're talking about, about making ourselves more self-sufficient. And coming from a conservative LDS standpoint, self-sufficiency, helping your neighbor, and be, being able to do all those things is, is things that is a basic principle of, of his beliefs. So a state bank perfectly fits into that worldview. So he got it right away. And there's a lot of people on the right talking about the need for us to be self-sufficient. And part of their reasoning is they believe that the dollar is going to collapse imminently because of the debt being out so, so much and all the rest of that stuff. And some of it gets a little out there. But the fact remains is that he's committed to us creating a way of getting more access to entrepreneurs of capital while at the same time being able to, to have control over our own economy without depending on large private banks in New York. And, and that, that means he's committed to it. And he's so committed to it, he even actually told me that he wants me to be his vice chair, not in a title, but in reality. So I'll be sitting to his right in the committee, and I'll be leading the call to audience, which is significant because the actual vice chair is the majority leader. Mm -hmm. so, so we'll see how this works out. But he's going to have a whole series of presentations from people from all over the spectrum about what we can do. Another value on the conservative right is they don't want to increase the size or scope of government. So they want to make sure that that's not an element of it. So that's a little concerning. Yeah. But when he says that, we may not have a state bank, he says, I think what we really need is a banker's bank. Just a state bank. But don't tell him. Don't tell him. <laughs> so I think we're, we're, we may be able to get it from a different name. And, we, and I think in any case, we'd be ramping it up slowly. And I think the concept would be, let's start it out with $100 million out of our state money and start that as increasing capitalization for community banks. In the next year, $250 million, the next year, $500 million, the next year, a billion, and raise it up so that we can roll it out and, and make that happen and start, start to make that work. Um, there are other issues about potentially creating a state deposit insurance company the, uh, rather than FDIC. Um, that he's talking about as well. And, and he's very, very serious about this. He sends me long emails at 7 in the morning um, that, that, he, that he's brainstorming about the whole thing. So I, I'm, I'm very excited about the possibility of what we can do in the Financial Institutions Committee with uh, Chairman Farnsworth on this one. And the fact is, since he is doing this from a perspective that makes sense to his right, that we will get a lot of unexpected allies in this. And that's my favorite part of the legislature. When we can actually get unexpected allies to come together, then uh, there's magic going on. I think that's what the founders intended. So that, that, that's exciting. What gets me all down is when it gets all partisan. I hate that stuff. But I, this is an opportunity we really can come together. That's why I'm really excited about what, uh, what Jim and Pam are doing in order to make this happen. So um, I'll stop there. We're gathering allies. There's a lot, a lot of going on. Um, but I'll take any questions too, and if you have questions for Jim, you can come out and do that too.